you know, smoking. Smoking is probably my, my biggest addiction. I remember going back down, I remember seeing this like blood spurting out of my leg. It literally felt like fire inside my body. Like, and I was, you know, start questioning, like, if God's real, why has all this bad stuff happened in the world? Like, look at me. You can have your leg amputated. I remember then in that moment thinking that I was Jesus. Like, mum, please don't tell anybody I ever said this. What is your name? Where are you from? And how was your upbringing? My name is Zachariah. I'm 25. I'm from the Sunshine Coast. And my upbringing was really nice. I had two very loving parents. I had a brother and a sister. I went to a Christian private school and I felt very, very loved from, you know, I was, I never really, what I would call never really misbehaved or did anything of bad behavior in primary years. A kid that had his socks right up below the knee you know, I had my eyes dotted and my T's crossed. Got really good grades. I did really well. Um, I did a lot of extracurriculum sport and to my knowledge back then had a, a little bubble around me and it was, um, it was really nice. However, perhaps, you know, moving into more of your middle school years, things start to change. Like you go through some hormones, you start dating, then there's parties you know just as you've gone to parties before as like a kid but now there's alcohol and you know one thing leads to the next and i remember taking my first drink that one drink i remember just spinning out pretty much blacking out like had no control of my body i remember throwing up you know you, you, you still keep going to a few more parties and then the fun thing to do is you know have a few more drinks before going to a party Getting drunk is, you know, you're near 10, 11, 12. Thought it was fun, thought it was cool. So where it started to really spiral out, you could say perhaps towards, perhaps towards the end of year 11. That's where I started trying drugs for the first time, smoking weed. I think we had it out of a billy at the time and as soon as you had that hit I just remember spinning. I remember laying, having to go lay down on a bed because my head was spinning so much. I felt like I physically couldn't get up off the ground. And then I remember closing my eyes and um, wanting to go to sleep. And then I remember waking up. I thought I had slept all the way until the next day in the afternoon. That's how long I felt like I was out for. <laughs> And I remember waking my brother and I was like, we gotta go, we gotta go, we gotta go. And, you know, I got home and I realized it was still the same day. You know, now I'm 18 and you have an access pass to go to clubs, buy alcohol, just go do what you wanna do. Go to clubs and you sort of just take that scene to the next level. And, you know, before you know it, I'm like, you know, you look back at your life, you're like, you're like 18, you're 19, you're 20, you're 21, and you're just on the merry-go-round. Same thing, you work, you go party, you work, you party, you work, you party. You know, but things really started to get out of hand, especially when you, you know, you start then smoking every day, you know, you know, once a week or once a month or once every few months to six months turns into a couple of times a week, every night, in the morning and night, like it's just all the time. It doesn't stop and it's just going round and round and round. I was at one of my friend's places and we were smoking. I'm not sure of the occasion because there was just so many occasions. Yeah. And I remember talking to his dad. I think we were him, him and I were the only ones up at this time. And I remember being, I mean, I was so high. I didn't even feel like I was here anymore. I remember looking at him. I remember looking at his face and I could literally see like these bumps starting to appear on his head. like. Horns, like literally, like if you people these days get implants under the head, like look at horns, that's literally what it looked like. I literally saw him have these horns on his head. I remember sharing with him like this little vision or dream that I had. I remember then in that moment thinking that I 
was Jesus. And I remember, I don't know, I was just spinning out so much because of what I saw on him and then what was what, what I started thinking or hearing. So I thought it would be a good idea to go home. I'm driving home and this is when I got over the bridge and I literally heard this voice saying like, you know, if you're Jesus, you can just drive yourself home. And I was like, well, yeah, that makes sense. So, you know, it's like, take your hands off the wheel and close your eyes. And I, I took my hands off the wheel. I closed my eyes and I'm driving. And then this voice last me was like, wake up. And I like, I remember just waking up, grabbing the wheel, pulling myself back over as I almost crashed into the petrol station. This is like two, three o'clock in the morning. I remember waking my mum up because I'm still living at home at this time. And I remember waking my mum up like, mum, I think I'm the son of God, like I'm Jesus. <laughs> and um, oh, she, she just saw, she probably just saw how out of it I was and knew that I was smoking. She asked if I'd been smoking. I said, yes. And she said, look, you're just, you know, you're, you're tripping out, yeah. <laughs> simply put. Yeah. And I was like, okay. Was she upset or angry with you for saying that or? No, she wasn't upset or angry. I'm, I think I went to her the next day though and I was like, mum, please don't tell anybody I ever said this. Now I'm going to strip clubs. I'm, I'm taking pingers, caps, pills, whatever you had. You remember taking, taking numerous ones all continue to spiral out. And at the begin, beginning of uh, 2020, mm -hmm. everyone knows how great of a year that was for most people. Mm. Uh, I remember when we all lost our jobs, that was just even a, a, worse off, a worse time in the sense that all we had to do was just hang around and smoke. There was nothing else you could do, so that's all we did every day. All this time, you know, I'd still gone to church a couple of times and, you know, I still believed in God because that's, that's all I knew growing up. That's everything that I'd learned. And you heard of God, you heard all these stories. And so I knew him. Um, and I'd even seen things like I'd seen, I'd seen angels before. I'd seen demonic creatures. I'd even prayed for people. I'd prayed for people who were injured and they got better. And so I just, I did that because that was, that's what I knew. Yeah, and I knew that because that's all I knew, if that makes sense. Yeah. You were just sort of going through a dark pathway in your life at this stage. I just made the wrong choices simply, yes. And that just led me to where everything went really south. Like I thought things were all right. You know, I could still go to work high as a kite. No one would even notice. You know, now you go on a work high, you're, you're high all the time, you're high at work, you smoke during your work break, you come home, you smoke, you go, you know what I mean? Um, so 2020. So 2020, I'm living with my girlfriend at the time, and we lost our jobs, months roll by. My sister's birthday is coming up, and I was like, I'm going to be sober for one day. And I actually really wanted to make her a present for her birthday. Mm -hmm. And she had a really big cat at the time, I'm talking like, massive like head to tail and big dude so i was like big dude needs a big cat scratcher yeah, okay. and my mate um his dad owned a recycling center at the time mm -hmm. and i was like i know what i'm looking for i went to the recycling center drove there on the way there before we went i remember slipping down the stairs and sort of looking around going no one saw that and i'm like i probably shouldn't be driving but you know, you get in the car and you go for a drive anyway. And you know, rock up at the recycling center. I went to the yard where all the timber was and I saw this piece of timber and it was actually an old section, well, a chopped section of a telegraph pole. So I'm like, that, that, that there was perfect. Uh, one of the guys was like, hold on, wait, we'll go get an excavator. You know, me being me, I didn't even, didn't even hear that. You know, I'm still just not even 100% there. I go climb up on the mound. I reach for this massive, section of a telegraph pole that's like this big in circumference and I start pulling it down and then I trip backwards and I throw the, the pole goes up and I fall backwards and as I come down I'm pretty much like lying almost completely horizontal if that's like my leg and that's the ground mm -hmm. and I drop the pole and it drops onto my leg it pinned me underneath the, the pole and I remember picking up the pole and pushing it off me I stood up and I remember going back down. I remember seeing this like blood spurting out of my leg. I had just wanted to rip off a bit of a shirt so he could just like bandage that on there for me. And they got me in my ute. I'm in the passenger seat holding my leg up on the cup holder. And 
one of the guys who saw it happen, he got in the car and they drove me to the local hospital. I remember seeing this one guy that I went to school with who ended up becoming a paramedic. He's a strong Christian man and it was just, you know, you could see God trying to get my attention just right from those moments there. And they wheeled me in. Uh, they sat me on the x-ray table and they x-rayed my leg. And I didn't think I had broken my leg at this time. I had never broken a bone in my body. I'm sitting here and I'm like, there's no way I've broken my leg. And then they show me the x-ray and you can, that's when you saw like crack, crack and compound. And what they explained to me, this was a double spiral compound fracture. So whilst I'm at this hospital, they put a plaster cast on my leg. Then they sent me to a bigger hospital. I've also been advised not to eat anything at this time, but because they're planning to do some surgery, drill down through the tibia shaft, put a rod through there and plates and screws where the break is. Uh, but of course it's their, you know, their legal obligation and, or legal duty to ask you then, you know, is this what you want to go through? Because at the end of the day, it's still my body. But miraculously enough, even though I've had these, I've got this double spiral compound fracture, my bones were miraculously straight. And on top of that, I'm in actually no pain at all. Whether that was the adrenaline, but I'm sure the adrenaline would have worn off by at least the first hour, two, three, four. This is the end of the day now. I opted not to have surgery, but I remember in that moment he asked me, do you want to go through with this? And I remember saying, I just remember this inside my being, like literally it was like this other voice and I was like, no, I believe my leg can get better. I believe my leg can heal. And he's like, okay. I remember one more person came in because this gentleman went off shift and another lady came in and she was like, oh, okay, just, you know, checking on you and whatnot. And she goes, oh, you're about to be dispatched and you don't, you, you're not going home with any pain medication. And I'm like, no, I'm actually not in any pain. And she was like, looked at me like, sure, you're not. And I'm like, I'm honestly not in any pain at all. And she goes, look, just to cover me, to say I've done my job, because maybe when you get home, you might be kind of pain. I'm like, fair enough. So she gave me the, the lowest dosage of the minimal scripted amount you can possibly give somebody. They, get, they just gave me crutches at this time. And so I've got this plaster cast on and I don't know if anyone's ever had a plaster cast. It's pretty much like having concrete on your body. And I've got this injury below my knee and I remember crutching around every time I'd like take pressure up and then down, like, cause I got this like big platform on this plaster cast. I could literally feel like my bones, like doing that, like where the brakes were. I went back a few days later and they were like, we're so sorry. Um, took it off, put a synthetic cast on, which was way lighter. Then they also put it above my knee as well. They made a patella tendon bearing cast, which I couldn't then extend my leg completely straight, which then allowed it to take no pressure then, which was much better. And they also gave me a wheelchair now, which was excellent, zero pressure. And you would think this would stop you from Smoking, but I remember this being one of the most traumatizing experiences I've ever had in my life. For someone like myself who grew up being like an athlete and very active and moving all the time and just to be put in a wheelchair, oh, this was really hard for me. Um, it was really actually quite depressing. And so, you know, to comfort myself, I bought weed, I smoked and I smoked a lot. I bought probably the most I'd ever bought in my whole entire life and I probably smoked more than I ever did. It was as soon as you'd wake up in the morning, you'd go to the top, like that's what we'd say. I'd go to send myself straight to the top, smoking billies, smoking joints, you know, all day long. Um, during this time of my broken leg, we, you know, went to the hospital a few times to check up on me, see how you are. Now I've approached the six week mark. I go into the, the x-ray room again, we cut off the cast, uh, give my leg a bit of a clean, it's a bit gross under there. Send me over to the x-ray table. We x-ray my leg. I go back to the plaster room. 
this lady's looking at it and she's a nurse and she, you know, gives me the all clear. She's taking it back with some tweezers. She's having a look. She goes, no, it's, it's all good. However, there was a supervisor walking past and I'm so thankful she walked past because she came in, she read the report, what was happening while I was in there. And she said, oh, do you mind if I take a look? And so she excused the other lady um, who was using, and she was using these plastic tweezers and she sort of gave her a slap over the head and was like, what are you doing using plastic? Give me some metal ones and gets the metals. And she starts peeling back some little bits of my wound on my compounded area. And I remember just this look on her face and I'm like, that's not a good look. And I'm like, oh man, what's happening here? Uh, so she leaves the room and said she'll be back. She ends up getting a head of department. Him, I've got a whole bunch of other specialists now. The nurses, the supervisors, I've got everybody in the room all surrounded me on this one chair, looking at my leg, discussing it. What they told me right then was what we've discovered. And they explained it to me like this, like, like your sinuses. I had this little, like this tiny little pinprick of a hole. I didn't think too much of it. I just thought maybe that's the way that you, my scab was healing on my leg. So even though it appears to be healing, what they explained is like your sinus, there was this funnel and it was actually going from the outside exterior of my body into the inside. So it was this funnel that was feeding bad parasite bacteria and infection. And that was the delaying of my legs healing because it was infected, my leg was infected, what they found out. And so then they've run me through some more news, which I thought, you know, couldn't get any worse from when they told me I broke my leg. Bottom line is that I've got a, an infected leg, like a staph infection now. Have I picked it up from the, you know, from the scrapyard? Have I picked it up from the hospital? So they're telling me, worst case scenario, you can have your leg amputated. And I'm like, I couldn't even fathom what I was hearing. I was in complete shock, like I was, I felt sick. I just felt numb. It was like time froze still whilst all these people were surrounding me. They said to me, look, we're gonna give it a good clean now. This should fix it up. And now we're gonna send you home. <laughs> we're gonna give you one more month. And if there is no sign of healing, then we're gonna take action. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and so I, I leave the hospital going home. I think I still kept on smoking. Uh, I thought maybe, oh, how about instead of maybe smoking my weed with tobacco, which was definitely probably delaying my healing too, instead of delaying, instead of um, smoking weed with my tobacco, how about I just smoke just green? Like, you know, just green is good. You know, green is fine. Like green is good for you. You know, if you're relaxed, you'll heal a lot better, Zach. <laughs> At one stage, I couldn't actually feel my leg and thinking about it, I couldn't feel it. And I thought it'd be a good idea to smoke to try and not think about it. And the most frightening thing happened to me then. I was on the couch and I remember going into like the biggest panic shock on the couch after smoking. I remember like violently convulsing like this. Like I couldn't, like my whole body was like, violently convulsing and I was petrified. It felt like I was going to die. That's literally what it felt like. It felt like I was holding on to these last few moments. Uh, my thoughts are spiraling out of control. I, my heart, I could literally feel my heart going like a thousand miles an hour and I could feel it like going up and down my arm and I thought I was having now then having like a heart attack from this panic attack. I remember calling out to my partner and my sister and to come over and talk to me. And apparently I was like talking really quiet like this, like no one. And I thought I was talking in full pitch volume and I was petrified. I thought I was, I thought I was genuinely gonna die and they were gonna call the ambulance. And I remember then, you know, being around all my mates and sitting at the table one night. I remember sitting there and just thinking, I was like, I don't even know if God's real. And I always used to think he was so real. Even though I've never met him, never seen him, no nothing. Like, and I was, you know, start questioning, like, if God's real, why does all this bad stuff happen in the world? About a, a week after the, the news about my leg, I was on a phone call to a friend who had been checking in on me, and I was probably high. 
he was getting on. I remember being on the phone to him and I, I crouched her into my bedroom. There's a wardrobe in there and I closed the door. I left everyone because I was getting a little bit upset. I was starting to get a little bit teary and I didn't want anyone to see me cry telling everybody what was happening to my leg and how I was feeling. So I went and hid myself away. But when I was on this phone call to him and you know, I got the crutches on my arm, I remember looking at myself in this mirror and just thinking, what have I become? Like, I don't even recognize the person I am anymore. I was just in absolute disgust of who I am. and I didn't even recognize the person I was anymore. Mid phone call, and the only way I was able to explain it then, what felt like two fingers touching my, like literally like the most gentle touch. Like it's like you could feel both bits of the, just touch your forehead like that. And I remember this fire just coming down like my whole body, like boom, like down my whole body. It literally felt like fire inside my body. Simultaneously, when that happened, I remember seeing this clear thing leave my body in front of me and ascend away. I then, at the same time, I literally saw like these big things like peel back my eyes. And when that happened, I remember having this, this is all going on all at the same time. Like this is within the same time. I remember having this like flashback, like, like the movies. You know, in the movies where you see someone and they show you having a, a real, like a flashback of everything that happened. I literally had a flashback of my entire life. Like I saw everything like, and the way it was described to me was like, everywhere that I had made decisions, which led to the next, which led to the next, which led to the next. And I understood it all. I understood why, why I'm at where I'm at today and why that decision led to that. And this went to this. And this flashback was just incredible. And at the same time, I just remember being filled with this understanding and this knowledge. And to this day that I know now is wisdom and understanding. And then simultaneously, whilst all this is going on, like if you could put this in a time frame of these things happening, it felt like 0.1 of a second between each of these little tiny things happening. It was all just this, this, this. I then remember being filled and I just remember feeling like this love, like the fire came, then I remember feeling this love and I'm on the phone. I don't know, really remember what was even said after those few things. I just remember feeling this love and <laughs> to feel this love. I've never felt this love before. And I remember being filled, filled and feeling this. And I just remember starting to weep. I just started to cry and cry and cry and cry. I told my friend, I was like, hey, I gotta go. I hung up the phone. And I just remember bawling my eyes out. I think I was in the bedroom for like 40, 45 minutes just crying. And then I remember calling out to my girlfriend. And I was like, I was like, Maddie, come here, come here. And she came and she's like, what? <laughs> and you know, all the time that I'm being an absolute monster to her because I'm so broken and so damaged. I'm watching pornography behind her back, hiding smoking. I was lying to her about smoking, even though I was high all the time and just, just being so deceitful and that just damaged us. But when I called her into that room, I was like, Maddie. And she's like, what? And I'm like, I'm here. She's like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm like, I'm here. I was like, I'm here. What I was trying to tell her and what I experienced in this moment and what I understood. And I can always pinpoint a time frame. It was like nine years, I was free. Like I was, I was free. Like I, I could see, um, like everything was bright again. Like I could see the trees. I could see everything was green. Everything was bright. Everything was happier. Like I'm present. Like I'm not, I'm here, I'm free. I, and I was like, she doesn't know. I was like, she doesn't know. Oh man. And then like the moment when I was in the hospital and I was like, I believe my leg can heal. That evening, I was like, this must be the God that I know. And I said, God, if you're real, send me a dream. Don't ask me why I said send me a dream. It was just the first thing that came to me. I was like, if you're real, send me a dream. I remember being like so filled and so happy. I started reading my Bible. I stopped smoking. 
I stopped watching porn, I, you know, everything, everything just fell. I remember asking God, I think I asked him a few more times, send me a dream, send me a dream. I didn't get any dreams. And then the day before my final review for my leg to find out what they're gonna do. So my review is on the 19th of June and on the 18th of June at five o'clock in the morning, I had a dream where I had to run across country. Out of all things, I had to run across country. And the setting was like a school, a sports and physical education class. You know, roughly 20 to 30 students in the class. However, instead of running like one single cross country, to make up the kilometers, we had to run laps because of the area wasn't too big at all, you know, say around one acre, it wasn't a big area. In the dream, I knew I had just had my cast taken off my leg and I wasn't entirely up for running the race. I wasn't, I was like, oh, you know, I'm a bit weak right now, like I'm not fully sure. And so I left it at that. The entire class ran the cross country and then they moved on to the next exercise, which was wrestling. And I remember seeing this one big kid in the class, he beat everybody. And I remember watching, and I'm just sitting down on the sideline, I remember watching, and I'm like, you know what? I can do this. And I just felt this uproar inside me. So I asked the teacher, and the teacher in the dream, he was like two and a half meters wide by two and a half meters tall, like a big Sims character. And I said, teacher, can I run this race? He said, go ahead. I'm like, all right. So I get up and I start running. I start running and I'm running and I'm running. I get to like around my 10th or 11th lap and my legs were just spent. Like I told you, I was already feeling weak in the dream, but I wasn't gonna give up. I was so determined to finish and run this race. So I start crawling. I remember I'm crawling, I'm crawling, I'm crawling, I'm crawling. And then I go a few more laps and I collapse in a slump. And I'm like, oh, and my legs fully give way. Like, I, I feel like I'm a paraplegic now. <laughs> and then suddenly sticks pop into my hand. So I'm like, I grab these sticks. My legs are like behind me, like dragging behind me like a seal. And I'm like, just clawing my way. I'm like, I'm gonna finish this no matter what. Like my legs are just dragging with every claw mark I dig in and I'm going. I go a few more laps and then I entirely collapse in front of the teacher. I knew at this point I actually physically and mentally could not go on any further. I was completely and utterly exhausted. My hands were like ripped up and bleeding. I was dirty. I was sobbing. I was just physically and mentally exhausted. I then cry out to the teacher. I'm like, teacher, how many more laps do I have to go? He said, Zachariah, you're on your 18th lap. You've got one more lap to go. And as I was like, right, one more, as I was about to do that last lap, I woke up. Interestingly enough, my mum and dad were both staying over the night, transitioning in between homes. And I remember going out to my mum in the, the living room and I was like, mum, I had this dream and I explained to her the dream. And she said, honey, what's the date tomorrow? And I was like, it's the 19th. And I was like, oh, the 19th. You know, I'm just thinking now, I'm like, I was meant to run my 19th lap and I'm like, and, you know, and then I just have that moment of like, what happened in the bedroom? I got my dream and I'm, now I'm thinking like, <laughs> what's going on here? But you know, the most crazy thing as well, I mean, everything seems crazy right now. But when I woke up from that dream, my legs physically felt like I had run across country. And now, you know, I'm thinking I've got this dream. I asked God for this dream. My review day is tomorrow. You know, I'm still not like, I don't know, I'm still just like, well, what's going to happen? And now it's the 19th and Maddie, she's driving me to the hospital. We're going to find out what the, what the news is, what's going to happen. So I'm pretty nervous. So I crutch her into the hospital, one thong on, cast on the other foot. I remember we went and, you know, we're going to the 
plaster room again. I'm like, hey guys, you know, I've gotten to know everybody then. So we cut off my cast again, go onto the x-ray table, x-ray my leg, go back to the plaster room. I'm just hanging around and, you know, just chatting to the plaster team. And, and the head doctor, he walks into the room and he has his news report and he holds it right up. And with two hands, he's like, you're healed in front of everybody in the room. And I remember seeing the x-ray pop up next to me on the screen. He showed me and it was just this, what I would believe, perfectly put together tibia shaft. It was healed. And so now I'm like completely spun out. He asks me to stand and I'm like, oh. So I get my crutches and I get up. My leg is like an absolute tweak. Like it's, there's no muscle left. I put my foot on the ground. I haven't put my, my heel on the ground in like 10 weeks. I put it on the ground and I remember feeling a bit like disorientated and I was like, I felt really sick and I was like, my leg was just weak. I said, oh, I can't, you know, he wanted me to walk and I was like, I can't walk, dude. What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, what do you want about? I can't walk. And then he's like, you know, go show the other guy who I see in the face. He's like, go show the other guy. So I crutch her in and I'm like, look, and he's like, so what it's better and i showed him i showed him the x-ray and he's like he was just gobsmacked because he was the first person i've seen the night that i came in he was also there when the news was getting delivered to me and he was just like amazed he was just there was no words there was just no words so i go back in and the head doctor he's like awesome grabs his clipboard and turns around and just walks away and i'm like what now? Like, do I get a moon boot? When do I come back? And the pastor team was like, just go see the front reception. And I'm like, all right, so I crutch her out and I go see the front reception and I'm thinking like, where's my moon boot to help me start walking? Like I've had injuries before and you know, the next step is the moon boot. And she's like, that's great, awesome. Come back in a month's time. We'll see you then. Okay, um, you know, take my other thong off because I came in with only one thong. I didn't think to be leaving totally fine. And so I was a bit cheeky as well. I took the staircase down and crutching down the staircase. I messaged Maddie. I was like, hey, come pick me up. As I was waiting, I just felt led to go stand over in the grass. That was the most sensational feeling. It was like putting your foot on sand for the very first time at a beach or like on the back of like a sheepskin, like it was just so good. And it was a bit overcast that day and the sun was shining through the clouds and there was a little bit of like a sun shower happening. And I heard the most audible voice, like it literally pierced through the wind itself. So strong, it said, Zachariah, just like Peter, getting out of the boat and walking towards me. Let go of your crutches, come walk towards me. I promise I won't let you fall. I let go of my crutches then. And I started to walk. <laughs> so in between all this, and I, I can't even wrap my head around it. So I'm waiting now then for my girlfriend to come pick me up and I thought it'd be funny to play a little bit of a joke. I put the crutches back under my arms and she pulls up and looks at me. And I'm like, you know, got the crutches. And she was like, oh, look, no cast. And I'm like crutching over. And then I push the crutches away and start walking and then she just bursts into tears you know and we just sat in the car and we just cried together and hugged and i was like take me to the beach another element of this story is what happened six months towards the end of the year and my mum discovered a file which contained a prophecy from back in 2013 which a gentleman named josh woods and his son harry were involved and this is what was said I'm going to play this for you now. Um, we can say hey, you're a, a young man in the congregation, 16 years old, by the name of Ralph, and he's like, well, actually, there is. And so my son is really disappointed to see his son, and he's five, 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 uh, I, he said that, and I said, but like Zacchaeus said, because he said, um, he said, like Zacchaeus is a tree, he said, but Zach doesn't want to climb the tree. And I'm like, okay, what does that mean? And so I just believe that this, I, I, don't, I don't know your son, so I can uh, 
just ask the Lord what, what exactly this guy and I just believe this, that obviously Zach is from the Bible, climbed the tree to see Jesus. And I think even if Zach, as he's grown as a young man, the things that, that are trying to, been trying to get his attention, the things that are maybe even trying to stop him from wanting to climb the tree to see Jesus. But I believe that God's bringing a shift in his life. I believe the Holy Spirit's going to do a work in his life. And there's going to be a fire that's going to come, that's going to touch him. And I believe that God is going to mark Zach. And there's going to be a fire that's going to rise up inside of him. Just like Zach is saying, I have to see Jesus. And he did whatever it took, he climbed the tree to see Jesus. And I believe that God is going to put a fire, and he's going to put a zeal and a tenacity and a determination in Zach to the things of God. And he's going to go places and do things that other people wouldn't do. When others just got a happy bit in the back of the crowd and not seeing Jesus, Zach is going to go places and do things that other people wouldn't do. He's going to climb the tree to see Jesus. So Father, I thank you for this awesome couple, Lord, this beautiful family. Father, we just lift them up to you right now. And Father, we lift, lift Zach up to you right now. Why don't you guys just hold hands for a second? Father, we just lift Zach up to you right now. Lord, we ask that your will, Father, will come to pass, Lord, in Zach's life and in this family. Lord, we just call forth that fire. We call forth that passion, that zeal, Lord, that tenacity inside Zach, Lord. Then, Lord, even if it seems, Lord, in the, in the outset, Lord, that he can't see Jesus through the, the crowd, that, Father, he would be so determined, Lord, determination would rise up in him, Father, that he would go to any limit to reach out, to see Jesus. And that, right now, we call out and we say, that climb the tree. Climb the tree in your life that you may see and behold Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. I just release the glory of God upon you. I release the glory and the kingdom and the power of God upon your family, upon your home, upon your children. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. Bless you, God. God Thank you for the Lord. I forget a brother that I Incredible, right? So what I've understood now is he said he went on to prophesy about what his son Harry, who was five years old at the time, and he's and he went on to prophesy about this saying, and there's going to be this fire that's going to come and it's going to touch Zach and it's going to change him and it's going to want and it's going to change him to want to see the things of Jesus. And so all this has come true. You know, I was that I was that 16 year old boy by the name of Zach in 2013. How incredible. So a prophecy that was spoken about seven years before came to pass. Absolutely incredible. So yeah, my life now, three years down the track, I could tell you countless stories of the miracles and the provision of God that's been in my life. And he just continues to keep opening doors to this day. Why I'm sharing this as well is because he's put it on my heart to do it, be a mouthpiece for him, be a conduit for him. And just, just to show others, it doesn't matter where you're at right now. You know, someone might be walking right in the path where I'm at right now and I could just speak into their lives this way. And this is why I'm doing it. And I'm doing it to encourage others, you know, to share what they have to share. That no story is insignificant. And all your testimony brings glory and honor to God. In preparation of this video, filming it, God put in my heart this morning to share with you from Isaiah. And he said, Isaiah 61. Because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So the whole chapter is 61. So the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn 
So I'd like just to take a moment and finish in prayer and just pray for anybody. Thank you, Lord, that you are the author and finisher of our salvation. No matter where we are, what circumstances we're in, we can always reach out to you and you will answer our cry. Thank you, Lord, that you are a good, good father. Lord, I pray right now for anybody watching this that may be going through a similar situation. I thank you, Lord, that their sins are forgiven as far from the east to the west, that you see them as spotless and blameless in your eyes. But Father, thank you most of all for your son who you sent down to pay a price for all our sin. And when he said it is finished, it is finished. So thank you, Lord, for the finished work of the cross. And I thank you, Lord, that those who are bound right now, I pray pray for chains to be broken in Jesus' mighty name. Lord, I pray for an encounter. And Lord, I say, do it again. Do it again, Lord. Don't stop here. Do it again. Jesus' name.